Thank you, Alberto, for your for your kind uh, introduction. Let me start with a few words of thanks. Um, uh, well, thanks. Uh, thank you for coming on an early Friday morning, uh, and I appreciate your time is uh, precious. Also appreciate that attendance is compulsory. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate. <laughs> But I would also like to, to thank uh, Raimundo and Alberto and everybody here who, for welcoming me uh, so warmly this, uh, this week. I've had a fantastic week uh, here in, uh, in Mexico City, uh, uh, chairing a few seminars on, on international law and legal forms. And then we had, I think, fantastic sessions with, with the students. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful. Um, let me be, maybe a bit contextualize what I want to do uh, in the next 15 minutes. Uh, I won't speak uh, long. Uh, I'm going to present some work in progress, um, which means that a few things may be half baked. Uh, this is still very experimental. Uh, so I'm trying something out here and trying an argument. I mean, the book has been written, let's be honest. It's the, the chapter you may have read, or at least the chapter you have received, is the, uh, is the introduction of, of a book which I've completed. Uh, but, but I'm still in the phase where I'm streamlining and fine-tuning the, the, the argument, and, and that's why I, 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 I'm very, I very welcome your your comments, criticisms, um, because it's still in the making, uh, and that's that's always the way I do: is that you prepare your argument, then you 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 start a tour, you present you present it here and there, and then you go back to the drawing board with with all the comments and feedback you've you've received, and I and I hope. So for the next six months, I'll, I'll be presenting the, the, the argument in, uh, all over the world and, and trying to secure some feedback. Uh, and then I'll go back to, to, the, to my study and to find you in all trash, the, 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 uh, depending, of course, on the, on the feedback. Um, well, let, let me say that this is the very first time I present the uh, so, so I'm quite anxious to, to hear what, what you have to say about it. It's the first first presentation in a long series, which, uh, which will last until, until March. Uh, so thanks, thanks a lot, it's a wonderful opportunity, I'm, 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 very, I'm very happy. Um, if one caveat be, before, before I, I spell out, or rather sketch out the argument. Uh, I don't approach, so I'm going to speak about international law. I'm going to speak about international legal argumentation. Um, discussing some uh, features of contemporary legal arguments on international law. This means that I, I don't approach international law in a very formal way. I mean, I've been speaking for, about formalism for, for now four days, but now I'm moving away from, from this perspective. I'm not taking international law as a set of rules, as a set of formal rules. No, I'm constrained, for the sake of this book and for the sake of this argument, I'm constraining international law as a set of argumentative practices. International law is an argumentative practice. Of course, this, this argumentative practice may or may not be articulated around some rules, but that's not what I'm looking at. I'm looking at international law as an argumentative practice, that is, a practice by some professionals who are in the business of making claims about international law. That, that's, so so it's, that's the standpoint, that's the perspective I take in, in today and, and, and in the book. So, so it's not a very a formalist approach to, to international law, and, and I need to, to highlight this at this stage. The argument, in a nutshell. Well, the argument is that international law is an argumentative practice articulated around some key doctrines, some key argumentative structures, sources, responsibility. These are key doctrines, these are key argumentative structures or patterns of argumentative structures. Uh, this is what I call the Gospels, these key doctrines. Uh, any legal argument who wants to secure some persuasiveness, who wants to persuade, needs to be designed and shaped and patterned after these key doctrines. And, and the obvious candidate is, is the sources. Any argument you make about international law needs to be grounded in so the sources of international law. So these are the key doctrines. Well, that's a statement of the obvious. Legal arguments need to be, need to be articulated on key doctrines. 
Well, the point is that these key doctrines are derived from some authoritative text um, in a way that, that gives authority to these doctrines. But this, this link between the key doctrines, which I call the gospel, and this authoritative text, which I call the sacred text, <laughs> this link is completely artificial. So the point is that we've built legal argumentation on a false and unauthentic genealogy. There is no real link between these key doctrines and the text from which they are derived. And I'll give you a few examples to make all this, this very concrete, but for, at this stage I can just give you one, uh, so that you can get, you can get a sense uh, of, of what I'm speaking about. But, so, one of the key doctrines, well, I, which I call one of the key Gospels, is the doctrine of sources. We all derive the doctrine of sources from the, I mean, we, international lawyers, we derive the doctrine of sources from the famous or infamous Article 38 of the Statute of the International Court of Justice, which lists the different sources. Well, this link is fake. Because in The Hague, in 1920, July 1920, this white male who drafted the Statute of the Permanent Court of International Justice at the time, they barely spoke about sources. It was two days. They just listed a few things, including custom. But they never spoke, for instance, about the two elements the two constitutive elements of customary international law. However, today we all say customary international law rests on two elements, as indicated by Article 38. Whereas the authors of Article 38 never spoke about the two elements of custom. So it's a completely unauthentic and false genealogy. And, and the same holds for the theory of statehood, the same holds for the theory of responsibility. So that's why uh, I claim that legal argumentation rests on mystic structures rest on mystic structures, because these key doctrines are derived, are artificially derived from some secret, sacred text. And on top of that, and that's the second dimension of the mysticism of, of legal argumentation, these key doctrines are presented as rules. They are presented as rules, a set of rules, which, which gives them uh, uh, some obligatory character, an obligatory veil. And, and that contributes to the mysticism of international legal argumentation. Whereas behind it, there are much more, there are very, very complex uh, processes, which, which I will uh, uh, touch on today. So that's the argument in a nutshell. International legal argumentation is, is mystic because it rests on a false genealogy between the key doctrines, the Gospels, and the authoritative text from which they are derived. And all this is presented as a matter of rule. So that's the argument in that chain. I would like to formulate five remarks, and that's all. So allow me to formulate five remarks about, about the argument, with, with a view to triggering some, some reaction, hopefully. Um, so I will just say a few, few more words about this descriptive framework, this, this idea of Gospels and, and, and sacred texts. Um, I, will, I will say a few more words about the mystic character of legal argumentation, that will be my second remark. Uh, I'll then say why I think mysticism is inevitable. So I'm not trying to, to say that we need to do away from mysticism. We should just be aware of it because this is what makes legal, legal argumentation possible. So that will be the, the third set of, of remarks. The fourth set of remarks will, will, will draw on the consequences of looking at legal argumentation as a mystic practice. Uh, and, and I'll look at the, the consequences in terms of, of authority of legal arguments. And lastly, I'll say a few words about um, the making of these key doctrines, the making of these Gospels, the making of the argumentative structures of, of legal argumentation. So just five remarks, five sets of remarks. I'll, I, I promise I'll, I'll, be, I'll be, be very brief. So the, the descriptive framework this, this argument rests, rests on well, distinguishes between, and I've said enough already, distinguishes between Gospels, that is the key doctrines, sources, responsibility, subjects, for instance, and the, the sacred text, or the, the canonical text, the, the holy text, from which these, these Gospels are derived. Uh, for instance, the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, the Statute of the International Court of Justice, the, the Montevideo Convention, 
on uh, the rights and duties of states and so on. The, the UN Charter, uh, these are the holy, holy texts from which the key patterns of argumentative structures are derived by, uh, by international lawyers. So that's, that's a descriptive framework. Um, I should add, and, and you've seen that in the paper, that these, so these Gospels are derived from some very authoritative text, and they put in place some modes of legal reasoning, which I call the, the morals, uh, because, uh, because I, I, I use this, 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 this theological analogy. Um, well, what I call the morals is the very modes of legal reasoning. For instance, if you make an argument in responsibility, you need to demonstrate a breach, uh, you need to demonstrate that the breach is attri attributable to a subject. If you make a legal argument about custom, about customer international law, you need to, to demonstrate that there is practice, and you need to demonstrate that there is what we call opinion juris. Uh, so these are the modes of legal reasoning that are put in place by the key gospels, customary law, uh, uh, responsibility, and so on. So that's a descriptive framework. Well, this, this if, if, if you use and if you make use of that descriptive framework, you can shed light on the mystic structures of international argumentation, which, which I've already introduced, and, 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 and which is twofold. Uh, on the one hand, you have this false genealogy uh, between these key texts, between the, the, the sacred text and, uh, and the Gospels. That's one dimension of, of, of the mystic character of, of the international argumentation. The second is that these, these Gospels, these key doctrines, are presented as a set of rules. And so they are, that, that's something with which we discussed during the seminar this, this week, uh, but they are presented as sets of rules. And, and the reason thereof is, is very easy to grasp is simply because since they are derived from texts like the Statute of the International Court of Justice, the Vienna Convention Rule of Treaty, uh, and so on and so on, they look like rules made by virtue of these authoritative texts. So they look like rules. Uh, and, and that contributes to, it, to the, the mystic character of international argumentation because it, it brings about a, a mystic visualization of, of legal argumentation, as if legal argumentation was just a matter of rules. Or, of course, there are problems with, with, with mysticism, but the, the point, really, of, of the book is not, um, is not to get rid of, of, of mysticism and say this is all rubbish, and, and it's, the point is not to invalidate legal argumentation. No, on the contrary, uh, I do think we need to vindicate this mysticism. This, this mysticism is actually uh, necessary to preserve the possibility of legal argumentation. Because if we were to say, all the, if we just were to say, well, the way we argue on sources is just how a few white males in, in, in July 1920 thought about, uh, about the sources of international law, we would be caught into endless discussions about the foundations of our legal arguments and the foundations of the key structures on which we build legal arguments. Uh, we, would, we, we would constantly be, 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 be caught and, and, and trapped into uh, justificatory <coughs> arguments about the foundations of our legal arguments. So I, I do believe out of a certain uh, pragmatism that, that it is necessary it is necessary, and, and, and I, I do suspect that it is the same in the domestic law, that you have these mystical or mystic structures which are necessary to, to preserve and, and to allow argumentation to, to happen. Um, and so the point is, really, that the, the mysticism of international argumentation doesn't uh, amount or that doesn't bring about an invalidation of legal argumentation altogether. No, it is a necessary evil. I don't think it's evil in the first place, because it's in, inherent in, 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 in international law uh, and, and in, in, in the practice of, of international legal argumentation. So that's, that was my third remark. I really wanted to reiterate uh, the fact that it is uh, inextricable. Um, and so the point is not... Um, it, it's, it's, so therefore, it's, 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 not, it's not a very skeptical account of, of international legal argumentation. Uh, and, and, and I'm sure some, some critical legal scholars would, would of course criticize my, my, my account saying I don't draw the consequences uh, uh, from it. Indeed, I fall short of invalidating 
uh, all international human arguments, because I do think this, is, this mysticism is inevitable. Two more remarks. Uh, one remark on the authority of these Gospels, the authority of these uh, key structures of, of, of legal argumentation. Um, well, the authority seems to be coming from, um, from the rules. I mean, these key doctrines are presented as a set of rules, and therefore, therefore they feel uh, obligatory, compelling. They, they feel uh, uh, binding because they are presented as rules. But actually, the authority, I do think that the authority of these key doctrines around which we, we build our legal arguments is, is, is actually much more complex. It's much more than just a question of, of bindingness. I mean, if you approach this as a matter of bindingness, I, I do think it's misleading, because as such, you and me are not bound by international legal rules. Subjects are. But all these actors involved in the business of legal argumentation Researchers, students, judges, councils, they're not formally bound by these key gospels, by the, these key structures of international argumentation. <laughs> so I do think that the question of, of, of the authority of these key gospels cannot be reduced to a question of, of formal bindingness, <laughs> which is the consequence of them being presented as, as rules properly so called. But, but I do think that they get their authority from much more complex uh, uh, dynamics. Uh, which, which, which involve all kinds of psychological, institutional, uh, uh, social processes. So it's a, the, 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 the authority of these Gospels is much more complex and cannot be reduced to just a matter of, of bindingness. And so, so that's, that's the point I wanted to make about one of the consequences of, of looking at international legal argumentation as a mystic structure. Uh, there is, it, it, it shed light on, on, on the complexity of, of of the authority of these key doctrines, sources, responsibility, and so on, which cannot be, and the question of authority cannot be reduced to, um, to a question of, of, of bindings. Final remark about the making about the, uh, of, these, of these key gospels, of these key doctrines. Um, again, if, if, you, if you look at this key doctrine as being derived from the Statute of the International Court of Justice, the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, the UN Charter, and so on, it's the Monty of the Convention on the Rights and Duties of States. It looks like the making of the key structures of legal organization amounts to a normal process of lawmaking. <laughs> it's just about making these texts and conventions. Well, I, I do think that if you look at legal organization from, from the perspective, perspective I'm trying to offer, the making of these key doctrines is, again, a much more, com much more complex phenomenon. It's not just about making, uh, uh, signing, adopting the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. No, it is about some choices for some modes of reasoning, which are then packaged into a doctrine, into a gospel, which is then uh, anchored into a text. So, in that sense, the, the, you, <coughs> my account, I believe, uh, reverse the way you look at the making of these key doctrines. If you look at it as just a mere formal lawmaking process, well, it looks like states adopted the Vienna Convention on Treaty, or the state adopted the Statute of the International Court of Justice, well, which is now annexed to the UN Charter, and therefore from them we derived, or well, well, this text put in place some modes of legal argumentation. So that, that would be, I do think, the, 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 the normal way to look at it, and the intuitive way to look at it. Well, if you look at it from the perspective of mysticism, the making of, of these key <coughs> argumentative structures is, is, is actually completely reversed. Uh, it's no longer a top-down process, it's a bottom-up process. We first choose the way we want legal arguments about responsibility uh, uh, to be made. We first choose how we want these arguments to be made. And there were choices that were made in, in, in the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, uh, we decided that international responsibility should not be argued on the basis of fault or culpa, uh, and we decided that it, it, it was meant to be dependent on, on, on something allegedly objective, a breach that had to be attributable to a subject. That was a choice. Then we packaged that into the doctrine of responsibility, which was then put into uh, a formal text itself uh, acknowledged by the General Assembly. That's how we build legal argumentation. 
It is not the General Assembly adopting the Articles on Safe Responsibility and therefore imposing some modes of legal argumentation. No. We first choose a mode of legal argumentation. We first choose a, the, the way we want legal responsibility to be argued about. Then we package this and we put this into a, a key doctrine. And then we attach this key doctrine to an authoritative text. And so that's, that, that, I think there are consequences about, uh, if you look at international legal argumentation from, from the perspective <coughs> uh, this, this book offers, it, it, it really uh, revamp our, our accounts of, of the making of these key structures of, of international legal argumentation. So this is what I call mysticism. Uh, this is, these are the consequences uh, of the mystical structures of international law. Uh, I will leave it here. I don't want to speak, uh, I've spoken enough. Uh, as I said, the point is really to, to, collect, to collect feedback and, and, and hopefully criticism as well, because the, really the exercise is to, to fine tune the argument, to improve the argument. So thanks a lot for your attention and I'm very much look forward to your, to your comments and even your criticism. I see, I see ten hands, but maybe I should only be one chair. <laughs> okay. Um, would it be an idea if, if I were to sit so that I can yeah, take yeah. note? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so yeah, yeah, take yeah. Note of the... yeah. We, we take three uh, questions. And, uh, that. That. <laughs> okay, we, we will start with Jorge Luis Villarreal. Thank you for, for your presentation and for this provocative paper. Um, I'm quite ignorant about international law, so I just will speak from legal theory, if I may. Um, I have four points to make to you. <laughs> <laughs> very brief points, very brief. It's good that he's not an expert, but otherwise, <laughs> the, the first step. The way you describe the relationship between the Gospels and the sacred texts is that the notion of containing needs to be more carefully elaborated. Because it is a physical metaphor, but since you put it in the way that it's constructed or built it from uh, bottom up, it cannot be containing anything uh, other than being attributed as an object of interpretation. So the notion of containing in the first presentation of the relation between the Gospels and the morals and the sacred text needs to be at least more carefully considered in terms of the metaphor. Um, because it has, it has nothing to do with, with the text being assigned to any significant, but being reconstructed from the gospel. That's one clarification point. The second notion is the notion of validity within the legal argumentation schemes. Because it's ambiguous in the text. You have two notions there. The first notion is the idea of some modes of argumentation uh, present a general scheme of argumentation. As you put it, if you want to argue uh, re like responsibility of a state, you have to argue first attributing a breaching of some responsibility and then uh, finding a, 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 a causal link to the state. These are modes of argumentation. You are speaking of form validity or material validity. That is, there are certain premises structured in a certain way for certain themes in international law. But then, you talk about validity in terms of social consensus within the practice. That is, what are the acceptable, agreeable um, modes of argumentation? And this talks about the pragmatics of the scheme in a second sense that is not necessarily linked to the syntactical form of the argument. So the notion of validity is twofold, and now this is ambiguous in the text. The third point is your theory behind your notion of interpreted communities. Because one of the key points that you put forward is that you are amazed that the sacred text is falsely linked to the Gospels. And that is that the Gospels are the ones that are um, generators of the text and not otherwise. But then again, what is the notion of interpretation and interpretative communities? Because at least from a radical uh, interpretative theory, for example, fish, or a more moderate one, at least Dworkinian uh, point of view, this is, this is nothing to be amazed of. That is, there's no necessary connection between an object of interpretation and the significations that the community <coughs> attributes to the text. Either because there are contested concepts behind that, or either because they share a point, or either because there's a, there are radical interpretation at this stage of the interpretative process. 
at, at any, any, any case, you need to be more clear about what is your, your backup theory of community interpreted communities behind that. Mm -hmm. And the final point is the notion of building legal argumentation. Because even if legal gospels builds modes of argumentation, you have to distinguish between an, ex an internal and an external <coughs> mode of building argumentation. And this, this comes to my first point. Because, for example, you could have a gospel in terms of the agent of the states, as a very <coughs> renowned gospel in international law, but then again, from an internal perspective, that could be internal variations as to how can we construct the notion of agency in international terms. <coughs> so you have the notion of a concept, so to speak, that is the building of legal argumentation in an external way, and you have different variations of the argument within the practice. And your notion of building legal arguments from the gospel is too broad to distinguish between <coughs> the concept and the conceptions of every argumentative scheme, scheme within the interpreted uh, community. Thank you so much. <coughs> yeah, thank you very much for your paper. Uh, I really like it and I look forward to <coughs> reading the whole book. And when I finished the, the read the paper, the first thing that came to my mind was the title has to be changed by, and I suggest something like, The Holy Grail of International Legal Argument by His Holiness Jean d'Astronom. <laughs> and then the second thing that I thought was that this uh, reminded me a lot of Marty Koskenyami. He said, This is Marty Koskenyami on drugs. Because you live in Amsterdam and say, Well, probably that's your answer to that. But then you build uh, your own argument, and it's very, very interesting. I really like it, and I congratulate you. I probably don't share all the points, but it's always good to have some refreshing ideas to legal argumentation, and that's, for me, that's, that's really, really you, you, part of you contribute that, to that. Um, one of the things that um, <coughs> I struggle a little bit is like, uh, you said in one of your papers that gospel certainly contribute to the anti-intellectualism of international legal thought. And then uh, I would like you to elaborate a little bit more on the anti-intellectualism. Because at the end of the day, I mean, you said that Gospels are necessary and it's part of the mysticism in which we, we need to build an, a legal argument, an international legal argument. So, because we relied on uh, that uh, mysticism, it means that we are intellectual, anti-intellectual, or I don't know, I mean, could you please elaborate a little bit more? And then you, you mentioned about the authority and then the authority of the doctrine, but I saw, and probably it's a suggestion, probably you need to see also the idea of authority from, from the person who is building the argument. I guess that's a very important point, because it's not only the doctrine, but it's who, who is saying what. And then, uh, because you mentioned a couple of times white, uh, white males uh, doing certain things, and then probably that's part of the authority in international law, and then a lot, uh, a lot of that comes to that uh, Eurocentral vision of international law. So the authority at least has a personal dimension, if you want, or uh, beyond the idea of, of doctrine. And, well, I, I will leave it like that. Ça ne vous dérange pas si je vous pose une question en français Parce que oui, vous voulez, vous, je voulais faire la question au professeur Bradley euh, Tondo, je demande toujours d'entendre les conseils ici Donc voilà, je voulais faire la question au professeur, si ça ne vous dérange pas Pas du tout. Merci beaucoup. Et bon, avant tout, et en passant aux choses sérieuses, euh, je, je vous remercie infiniment pour euh, cet article. <rire> cet article euh, rigole très, très pro provocatif, comme euh, Jorge a dit. Et en fait, euh, je voulais juste poser une question, euh, si vous avez déjà pensé, parce que vous avez euh, nommé euh, l'article 38 de la Convention des biens, et il avait apparemment un problème du statut. Excuse-moi, du, du statut. Et en fait, euh, vous avez invoqué un, un problème des généalogies, si j'ai compris, de, de toutes les sources et tous les, et les problèmes euh, concernant les sources du droit international. Alors... Euh, Est-ce que vous avez pensé à l'idée, parce qu'on a, on a eu un colloque euh, la semaine dernière du droit romain, et en fait on a parlé, et on a fait la distinction justement entre, entre juste un style et juste gentil. Et vraiment pas l'idée de, de juste gentil comme on l'entend, on le comprend au jour d'aujourd'hui, c'est-à-dire euh, dans le centre du droit international. 
c'est surtout l'idée euh, du juste gentil comme une idée du loi universel, du loi d'une loi équitable qui fait la différence ou qui essaie de d'éliminer de, euh, la différence entre les étrangers et les citoyens romains. C'est juste cette question. Si vous avez pensé dans ce type de, de concept pour trouver une, une généalogie à euh, votre problème euh, concernant la généalogie de votre article. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Je vous laisse la route Merci, c'est très gentil. Ah, <rire> I hope you don't mind if I remain seated. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> because there's a lot to elaborate on. Even if actually I, I don't have much answer to, to, to offer at this stage because I, I take this as a, as a very useful feedback and I'm immensely grateful. Uh, you, you, I think you touched on, 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 on points and aspects of the argument that, that still need to be fine-tuned and substantiated. Uh, so let me all thank you. I mean, this is all very, very relevant. Uh, I, I definitely, Jorge, I definitely think that the idea of containing or the, the, the embedment of, of the gospel in the text is something that needs to be spelled out and it's not yet uh, the case. I, I agree that there are two notions of validity in the argument and that needs to be either explicitly distinguished and acknowledged or one of them should be, should be removed. And, and I do think actually that formal validity, like formal validity of rules, is not necess necessary for the argument. So this, This could be left out, it's a very good comment. There is indeed a theory of an interpretive community behind it. I'm, I'm very much, we discussed that this week with, with the students, I'm very much with, with Fish, of course, but the reason it's not in there is that that was the object of my previous book. So that's, that's laziness. Uh, I didn't took pains to, to, to spell it out again. Uh, there is indeed a theory of, 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 uh, of an, a notion of interpretive community behind it, which you rightly spotted, which is very determinative of the rest of the argument, and I do think that, as you, as you rightly point out, it should be recalled, or at least explicitly uh, acknowledged. And, and yes, maybe the, the, my approach to building legal, legal argumentation does not sufficiently distinguish between internal and external mode of legal argumentation, and, and that's something that, 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 would be, uh, that would need to be, uh, to be worked on. So, I mean, So I'm not offering any answer, I'm just saying this is very helpful. I, I can really relate to these points. I, I do think you, 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 you're putting the, the, the finger on, on, on things that, that need to be uh, either substantiated or explicitly uh, acknowledged. Uh, uh, Louis, thanks for your very flattering uh, uh, comment. Uh, uh, it's true that I live in Amsterdam, but I don't know whether this has any impact on the argument. Uh, uh, um, well, it's... it's, it's I like the parallel with Marty Koskinyemi because it's very interesting that uh, 50% of my colleagues portray, portray me as a legal positivist and the other half portray me as a critical legal scholar. Yeah. In both cases I'm very flattered, uh, <laughs> even if I'm not sure that we all agree on what critical legal studies mean and what legal yeah. positivism means. Uh, it is true that I have spent a lot of time over the last years trying to reflect on whether one could be reconciled with the other and it's I have a book which is called International Positivism in the Postmodern World where we discuss this possibility of, of using methods of both. Of course critical legal scholars will tell you that they don't use any uh, predetermined methods but, but then it was very interesting that half of the authors in the book would say no you cannot reconcile them and then you had other people like Ian Klaber saying no you can reconcile them. Legal positivism and critical legal studies. I don't know where I sit. Uh, but I'm glad that today you, you put me in, in, in the basket of, of, of Marty. I mean, Marty himself would say he's not a critical legal scholar, of course. Um, one thing, though, which, which I think will, will still uh, put off uh, and, and, um, and will create some unease with critical legal scholars is that I do accept, and there is some kind of resignation, I do accept and come, I do come to terms with the mysticism of international argumentation. I rest on some false necessity and so on. Uh, I do stop there. I don't seek to, to, to bash and, and repudiate international legal argumentation, whereas some radical critical thinkers would, would say I should do so. Uh, I, I fall short uh, of, of doing so. And that's probably something which critical legal scholars would criticize me for, uh, for stopping uh, 
But, but I mean, in a way, Marty did the same. He, he also stopped, and, and we know he's been criticized for, for, for discontinuing the deconstruction. Uh, um, but, but yes, so, so I think it's a very interesting parallel. Well, the anti-intellectualism of international law, it's, it's, it's maybe something that I say in passing, or passant, mm -hmm. uh, maybe deserves some more comments. I mean, the reason why I'm, I'm reluctant to elaborate on this, is behind this there is a very cynical thought, which is, it wouldn't make sense to, to use taxpayer money or students' money to spend our days and nights reflecting on the foundations of legal argumentation. I do think we need to make the point that this is all mystic. But after that, that doesn't mean we should then have, have a, a brand new research agenda and, and all engage into the, into the researching of the foundations of international legal argumentation. I do think that there's a better way to use our energy and, and the taxpayer money. So, so that's, that's why I say yes, it's anti-intellectual, saying it's mystic and then we leave it at this, which is what I'm doing. Uh, yes, but, but I do think that it wouldn't make much sense to, 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 to all spend all days and nights uh, on, 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 these, on these issues. And, and, no, and yes, authority, I do think that uh, the account of authority I use, and especially the authority of in my account, of authority is, is, is not yet completely uh, spelled out, and it is uh, multi-layered multi because there's mm. the authority of argument, there's also the authority of the people mm. engaging in mm. legal argumentation, and, and that's something that, that uh, I would need to reflect on and, and probably further, further spell out. And merci beaucoup pour, pour cette référence au, au droit romain. Je crois que là, il y a, il y a certainement des, des recherches à faire. Uh, Je ne l'ai pas encore fait, je n'ai pas, je pas euh, établi de parallèle avec euh, cette, cette notion du, du use gain tune, euh, euh, et, et, et c'est quelque chose que je vais certainement, certainement regarder. Donc je, je, je suis très reconnaissant pour cette, cette remarque très pertinente. C'est exactement le genre de remarque dont, dont, dont j'ai besoin. Donc, euh, thank you so much. Brad, well, I'm going to make my comments in English. It's funny. 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 20-20 minutes of French outside is my maximum. <laughs> well, I mean, mysticism makes me think of religion, which makes me think of church, and every church needs a choir boy, so I'd like to propose as the choir boy a world-renowned uh, Canadian authority. Uh, Justin Bieber, because we're talking about uh, the rules of treaty interpretation. I think his newest hit, What Do You Mean, is perhaps the most relevant <laughs> song for the part of singing today. Uh, and I say this simply to make Luis sound a little less crazy. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. So, Thank you. There you go, Luis. Uh, because really, at the end of the day, I think if you look at the rules of treaty interpretation, they're codified in the Vienna Convention. And if you look at the practice in the WTO appellate body, and, and also in, in WTO panels, there's this habit they have of starting things off by saying, the rules of treaty interpretation of customary international law that we are bound to apply uh, are those found in Article 31, 32, 33 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. And then they don't usually say anything more about it. And after that, it's really much more of an intuitive process of interpretation. So I understand what you talk about as mysticism as, as also referring to, to it being a very intuitive process. And yes, we cite these formal rules uh, as, a, as a source, but uh, I think it's really just a token reference to the rules of treaty interpretation. And at the end of the day, what the tribunals do is, is they think a lot about what is the correct result in each case, and then they find a way to use the rules to justify that result. And so um, you know, the question is, at the end of the day, you know, what does this text mean, which is why I cite Justin Bieber, because it really, that is the question at the end of the day, what do you mean by, by this particular treaty provision, and, and, and how did you intend it to be applied in this particular setting? Uh, 
and of course intention gets ignored at work. Intention gets rejected, I should say, as, as a means of true interpretation of the WTO. Um, but this whole intuitive process, and, I, and I'm guilty of the same, I follow the same intuitive process. My favorite treaty rule is, my, my, my favorite rule of treaty interpretation is, um, uh, I can't think of what it's called. Um, Systemic integration? No, 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 it's the one that, that says that, uh, oh, effet utile. There you go, that's oh, the French word. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I love that rule because you can use it to justify pretty much any interpretation. <laughs> it's wonderful, and so and so. But I think that also backs up this notion that it really is about an intuitive process of justifying what you feel to be the correct result at the end of the day. And at the end of the day, it's all about communication, isn't it? It's all about human communication, and so that's why. No, I want to recognize the genius of Justin Bieber, and not just because he's Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, one uh, one impression of, <clears throat> of one reaction of the text and your presentation when you say that uh, you are seen uh, by international legal scholars on, on one side as a legal positivist and the other as a critical. Um, we have a saying here in Mexico that says that one can't uh, serve or work for two bosses, no? in the sense that uh, perhaps in this paper one has the, the sensation that you need to go further and uh, convey mm -hmm. the mask and uh, say it louder mm -hmm. and clearer, no? and perhaps uh, a, a slightly change to, to up the tone could, could work. No? A second remark is related with legal argumentation, and it's related with Jorge's, with Jorge's uh, questions. And I think that it could be useful to, to uh, acknowledge an ambiguity in, in legal argumentation. And uh, uh, Jorge pointed out to, to some meanings or senses. And I would say that it could be uh, a, as a clarifying thing, especially when you start talking about legal argumentation, uh, to distinguish between uh, the materials of legal argumentations, which could be the sources, the practices of legal argumentation, which would be the, the people, the agents of the offices, or the officials, uh, the, the argumentation or the ways to argument, the argumentation schemes, the structure. And uh, it seems to me that uh, these, these, uh, these meanings uh, are not clearly distinguished in the paper, and sometimes it, it seems that you are you are speaking of of the materials, uh, but it it is it uh, relates also to the argumentative structures. And the third point is that maybe you know that the, the text is also uh, very full of, of reference in international law, but perhaps. It could work to to see how the literature, legal argumentation, uh, uh, not only in the domestic side but in the theory of legal argumentation, uh, to, to have some lights on these matters. That's it. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. I only skimmed through the introduction, so apologies, apologies if I am missing something there. But uh, because of that, uh, so first comment I would say or or intro is you know Carl Schmitt uh, said that law is just secularized religion, right? And so I think that that's you know I mean there are lots of. Um, uh, uh, my sense is that there are lots of unconscious intellectual sources to your project. Uh, that's a big one. Uh, uh, that might be relevant uh, for some of the more substantive comments that are just elaborations on things that other people said. My sense is that, so, I think that there is a big tension between the, the constructive and the, cons the, the constructive uh, uh, Parts or ambitions of the of the project, and, and they show up uh, in different uh, uh, fashions. Uh, so first, when 
you say uh, that uh, this is fal false genealogy, but then you say, well, but all genealogy uh, is false, right? Uh, or in inevitable, right? Or mysticism is inevitable, right? Uh, In a, in a way, you you might not be um, a, a good enough a critical legal studies or whatever. That's a big camp, right? But you know, like a, a good critical thinker there, right? Um, the um, um, at the same time, you know, by saying this is this is well, but then, but tra by trying to do the, the constructive part, or for instance, when you. Um, use this very religious language, right, that again goes back, I think, to, to Carl Schmitt's uh, move, um, you dig a hole that it's too big then to, you know, get out from, you know, for the constructive uh, part, right? Um, then the other, the, another, another, another comment in relation to this, uh, you do internal uh, versus uh, external point of view. So, right, and you know, that was uh, one of, of Jorge's uh, uh, questions there. And I'm not sure how, you know, how aware you are of that very distinction throughout your uh, argument. My sense is that you are, even if you would like to do both at once, you cannot do both at once. So that's the, sec the second big tension here, right? Uh, and so the first part is very external, and then when you try to go back from an internal perspective, you can only say relatively general things about, you know, look at how complex this is and we should be aware. And so so I, I guess at the bottom, the bottom line is, there is, there, there are tensions coming here from the constructive and the constructive part of the project from the internal uh, and external uh, uh, points uh, of view. And my sense is that the way you are building at this point in time, the uh, critical part of the project makes very hard for you to either go back, to truly go back to an internal perspective or coming with any sort of persuasive constructivist, a, 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 a reconstructive account, right? You know, a la fees, a la dworking, a la what, a la, even Carl Schmitt. I mean, you should go all the way to decisionism or you should go all the way to, you know, to some sort of, you know, lois politics, right? That, uh, but you don't go there. You don't want to go there. But again, the, the, the hole you dig in the first part is just too deep and there is no way out. I think this is a very useful, very useful remark once again, uh, extremely helpful and, and I'm very, very thankful. Uh, Brad, rules on interpretation, I think you, you've just provided us with, with an excellent illustration of, of how mysticism works in, 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 in practice. I do think that the doctrine of interpretation is one of these key gospels, uh, Article 31. Uh, I don't think, you know, there was, uh, this is something we discussed yesterday. Uh, there was at the International Commission when they drafted the Vienna Convention of Treaties. It actually, Fitzmaurice said we cannot have rules on interpretation. We cannot have a provision. It doesn't make sense. Obviously, he was outnumbered in the in the Commission, and then he, he was replaced by by Wild Dog. And Wild Dog said, "No, we need rules on interpretation." So they were already in the making of the Vienna Convention, you had this this tension, and eventually they went for a provision, and they went for a gospel, and they thought we need we need a gospel. We on interpretation. We all agree, and that's something we said yesterday, that 31 doesn't constrain very much. On the contrary, it empowers. Mm -hmm. You know, because you can interpret according to the ordinary meaning, mm -hmm. the purpose, uh, the context. Well, each of these notions can themselves be interpreted. You can even take other rules into account, and other rules applicable between the parties into account. So it, it really provides an empowerment, and you can do whatever you want. But still, we, so it doesn't constrain at all, but still, we all speak the language of 31. Intuitively, I like this, this idea that actually mysticism has an intuitive dimension. But, but I would push it even further. It's intu it is intuitive, because that's the way we've been trained. We've, we've all been to law school to be trained to speak the language of 31 and to put a reference to 31 when in any case or in any legal argument, even if we know it's completely useless. <laughs> and, but that's part of the training, and that's part of the mysticism, I think. Uh, so so I'm, I'm completely with you, and I do think, I like the idea that there is a very intuitive dimension 
uh, this, this yeah. is something I'd like to further reflect on. Um, Raimundo, uh, thank you so much, and also thanks for, for, for having me here. Um, it's, I think you touch on, on a tension which, which has been hinted at by many of you, uh, also by Jorge, but also Maxim and so on, which is, yeah, that I, I sit uh, between two chairs, uh, I go too far or not far enough, um, I should maybe drop the mask, I, love, I like this, this, this expression. Um, yeah, maybe, um, maybe. I, I take very seriously your, uh, as well your point that um, I should be a bit more uh, systematic and rigorous when it comes to the concept of, of legal argumentation, that they, I don't distinguish sufficiently between the materials, the structures, the, the people, the methods or the ways in which you, I argue. Uh, so certainly, and, and it would help to have more uh, general literature on legal argumentation, uh, and not only for cosmetic purposes. I do think I, I need to, to to anchor this more firmly into the current debates, the current theory of, of legal argumentation. So, so this is this is very helpful. Um, well, and, and Maxim, great to see you here. By the way, we've been uh, coming across one another in various places <coughs> this last month. Uh, it was a good surprise to, to see you here this morning. Um, yes, Carl Schmidt is the elephant in the room, always in the air. Uh, maybe I should acknowledge that more, uh, more explicitly. Um, I mean, the problem is that if you, then people will put you into boxes. So you have to be very careful about the people you refer to. I mean, this is the politics of footnoting, and especially the first footnotes you do. But that's not. A, these are not neutral choices. You, you have to be very careful about the people you refer to. Uh, and, and, and you know that, or you know that at the stage of the book proposal, because you know that the, the footnotes you put in your introduction will be determinative of the reviewers. <laughs> as simple as that. Because the editors, I mean, I work for Cambridge University Press, I direct a series. I know how the, the commissioning editors work. They look at the footnotes and then they contact these people to have the book review. That's how it works. So it's true that the final product may be a bit different. At this stage, uh, I have, there are, the footnotes as, as they are, they're clearly incomplete. Uh, Raimondo said, said that already, and I don't think you're right, there's, some, there's a lot of unconscious sources. I mean, they're probably more conscious, it was more strategic. And yes, you make a fundamental point, which is, I think, uh, this twofold tension, um, tension between the deconstructive and reconstructive parts of the project, the, the, the tension between the internal and external points. I do think the argument at this stage is still a bit floating and dynamic, it, it oscillates between the two. And, and I do think part of the fine-tuning will be to, to stabilize the argument. Uh, on, the, on one side, on the other, or in the middle, but much more clearly. And I appreciate that at the moment it, it, it's very deconstructive, and then you touch on reconstruction, but stop there. And, 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 and somehow it may create some unease, and, and, and I do think you, you, you definitely uh, spot something that, that, that needs to be uh, to, to be firmly uh, more more firmly that needs to be stabilized because at the moment it's a bit floating. I appreciate it. it's a very valuable comment. Thank you very much. I have a question. And any other? Okay, I have a very very specific question and a very very big question. The the specific question is about. Uh, your terminology uh, when you use morals. Uh, I, I quote, such a terminological choice is informed by the necessity to reflect the prescriptive character of the Gospels of International Law. <coughs> well, not every prescription is a moral prescription. I think this is not a, a, a good reason for use morals because we have legal prescription, religious prescriptions, and so I think, uh, as I think for many, many people, uh, the, the simple fact that they, they are reading morals, they are uh, classic positivism, or morals, no offense. So you have to use maybe uh, some, some stronger semantic arguments for justifying the use of morals in this context. I agree that it is not a legal prescription. But I think the argument, morals because it is a prescription, it's uh, a little bit 
to to show it. And the the big the big uh, reflection, and actually it's not uh, a, a criticism. I think, and it is the same uh, tension. I think uh, Maximo uh, pointed out. We we have a a, a very very uh, destructive path. Okay, gospels, morals, sacred texts, <coughs> and maybe maybe uh, what international law uh, is from uh, at least. 45 is exactly because the church during the Second World War fails. So we need uh, to do the same thing but with the legal forms. And because the legal forms, we can do the same thing the uh, church usually did, but with a different justification of authority. So it is a, a very, very radical step, but why not? And it is not uh, necessary to go back to Schmidt. All the scholarship, uh, Jewish scholarship, Kelsen, Lauter Pact, etc. are a very, very uh, useful proof that in uh, international legal scholarship, the religious dimension, not Schmittian, but the opposite, the idea of a universal God, blah, 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 is perfectly reflected in international law. Not classic international law, but post-Second World War international law. And if you don't take these, these paths, well, so uh, what is the point? Because if uh, we need mysticism, uh, we need legal forms, we, uh, if the message is uh, okay, we have to uh, be conscious of that. Okay, but maybe uh, I, 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 I think I, I don't know if I exactly <coughs> understand very well the critical legal scholar criticism. So what you have to to do some step more, or uh, or so. What, what is the point? Very, very on point and very relevant. Um, Some uh, you know, other questions? Okay. So, oh, there is one maximum. Yeah. So I just want to follow up on mine, which is I, I, I am tired because I, I arrived yesterday at midnight and then I spent 24 hours. So uh, I did not mean to be overcritical. I think you have something wonderful in your hands. I really think so. The question is that you know, when you use all, all those tools for the critical part, you, here, here are a couple of choices you have, right, in terms of, you know, the project forward, right? You haven't published the book, right? I mean, you're writing it. Okay, so great. So, so one possibility would be to do the critique exactly the way you are doing it and just to stop there. Right and say, listen, uh, I am. They are a number. I am not saying that uh, 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 you know. There are a number of possible reconstructive uh, projects uh, from perhaps an internal point of view, you know, uh, or from an external one. Uh, um, uh, but I'm not going to do do them now. Right. So that's one possibility. Second possibility would be to do criticism, and then reconstruction. The, the criticism the way you are doing it now, but then reconstruction from an external point of view, you know, as kind of a, a almost as a legal sociologist, if you want, right? So, a, a, a explaining why in the reconstruction part, this is just not, you know, decisionism or law as politics, right? There is, you know, and, and perhaps Jorge gave you some clues into that, right? And the, the, the third possibility would be in the, to reform the critical part, might be dropped some of the language, though then you will lose lots of the power that there is in your account now, which is very powerful. I, 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 but, and then in the critical part, already plant the seeds that you are pl uh, planning to use for the reconstructive one, right? So those are three possible ways to deal with this tension. Um, 
And you know, it's just a comment, right? You don't need to 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 say anything now. But I think the critical part at this stands out is wonderful. You know, it's very powerful. You know, it's very persuasive. It's fun. You know, and and it's on point. Uh, um, the 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 thing is, if you want to do more than that, then you know you have to 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 see right how to whether it, there is a way to put all of these things together and and which one uh, it would be. And just to follow up on what uh, Maximo said, um, uh, hearing you uh, comment on many of the of the questions made me think that perhaps it could be profitable for your project to just sit between the two chairs, uh, but to exploit the, that uh, in the middle position. For, for example, let me give one example. You could exploit the idea of this intuitivism that uh, Bradley said about interpretation, uh, this mysticism, but then I can say, if we are to think that this mysticism is gratuitous, we are wrong because we still need to account for the practice of giving reasons to others in terms of international law. But then again, these reasons are itself contested in terms of an essentially contested concept, and this has an opaque dimension. But this opaque dimension that would provide an account for the mysticism, it's again attention with the idea of sharing the basic scheme of, uh, schemas of argumentation. But then again, they are not that shared in terms of their um, social validity that everyone would accept them as an adoptive form of argumentation. So we're going back to the mysticism. So perhaps you need to go in more circles around your paper in each of these corners and not sit in one of them. That would be very much in the style of uh, critical legal studies, right? And, and this way, I think you're more comfortable with what you want to say. Sorry, I'm taking notes because this is very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, um, before I come to Alberto's point, Maximo and Jorge, thanks for thinking with me about how to, to go even further. And, and, and I like this, these various options. I'm, I'm, I'm very very amenable to, 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 to some of them, and, and also the idea of building circles, uh, uh, indeed. And, and it, it would be a matter of saying things more explicitly, and, 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 and to acknowledge when you move from one perspective to the other, or saying explicitly what you don't do, and then maybe stop short. Um, actually, in saying this, I, I'm, I'm already partly answering Alberto's general comment, um, which is the, 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 the so what. Uh, and I think that ties in with, with this, this oscillation between deconstructive and, and, and reconstructive. I mean, this book is, is, is very uh, meant to be a counterweight uh, um, to, to some previous work, which was really on legal forms, uh, which was really a, a reconstructive work. Uh, this is my work on formalism five, six years ago, uh, which maybe is why people have... have labeled me a positivist. And that's true that now there is a bit this attempt to, to counterbalance this, this, this legal forms or these this, this reconstructions of formalism in, in international legal thought and international legal practice. Um, so, so, so yes, so the so what actually, I, I maybe unconsciously I assume I have answered it before. But of course you shouldn't assume that the reader knows that. So, so that's why I do think that the, maybe it should be more related uh, uh, and, and, and embedded in, in, in some previous work, where, where, which is much more reconstructive. And now it's, it's, it's certainly the deconstructive or critical part is dominant, obviously, as you all pointed out. But, but that's somehow a, a maybe an unconscious attempt to, to, to counterbalance uh, what, what, I, what, what I did before and what I have been speaking about this, this, this week here, thanks to your nice invitation. Uh, one reaction on the terminology. Um, you know, sometimes in a paper there's something you're not completely happy with, but you don't have the guts to, to, to get rid of it. Uh, and it takes until a colleague tells you, no, this is rubbish, it doesn't work, for, for you to find the courage to select and delete. I've been, this, this reference to morals, I've been struggling with it quite a lot. Uh, I do think today you, you, you give me a good incentive to, to get rid of it, because it's ambiguous. Uh, some positivist will take it in a natural sense, which is not what it means. Mm -hmm. I think I should just, and it's since the, the mysticism uh, originates in the link between 
between the Gospels and the secret text, you may not need this third layer in the descriptive framework. Uh, actually, probably it's not very helpful. Uh, so yes, I do think that today um, I'm, I will start mourning the, the loss of this reference to morals, but that, that's what I needed. I don't think it's... I should just speak about the modes of legal reasoning which are prescribed by, by the, the Gospel. As simple as that, I don't need to give it a fancy name. Uh, so no, thank you. Uh, this is great, guys. Thank you so much. Really, uh, I, I I can't wait to go back to my to my study. <laughs> <laughs> Any other question? No. Okay.